Now, from CBS 4 News, this is Facing South Florida with Jim DeFeedy. Good morning, I'm Jim DeFeedy, and welcome to Facing South Florida. To our friends watching on AT&T, we're glad to have you back. We have a good show for you this morning. We will take a look at the chances for gun reform after the mass shootings in Texas and Ohio. But first, there have been some significant developments in the Jeffrey Epstein case. For years, Palm Beach Sheriff Rick Bradshaw has been able to duck and dodge any sense of responsibility for the way his department rolled out the red carpet for a wealthy pedophile. After being convicted of soliciting sex with a minor, Epstein was given preferential treatment when he showed up to serve his 18-month prison sentence. His cell was kept unlocked, he was given the freedom to roam parts of the jail, and he was allowed to leave the jail for 12 hours a day, six days a week, on some sort of pretend work release program. Our guests this morning started pushing for answers, and there is now a Florida Department of Law Enforcement investigation. Lauren Book is a Democratic state senator who represents parts of Broward County, a survivor of sexual assault herself. She is an outspoken advocate for victims. Lauren, thank you very much for coming in. Thank you for having me. So this has always been the part of the story that I've always found fascinating, which is Jeffrey Epstein going to the Palm Beach County Jail to serve his sentence and basically being able to come and go virtually as he wanted to. Let's be really clear, he never served a day of that 18-month uh, luxury uh, vacation, let's call it. Um, he was able to take his limo from the stockade to his office nine times to his home. And from the deputy logs, we see um, deputies wrote that Mr. Epstein is enjoying his security, um, that he's very pleased and happy. Uh, we know that deputies are wearing suits and not, um, not even having access to his office. And referring to, to him as Mr. Mr. Epstein. Epstein. Correct. Not even inmate number 43291. Correct. Correct, correct. And as we said, you know, some of these survivors, these survivors were given a life sentence by this monster, this serial sex predator, things they never asked for. This monster spent 18 months in a stockade that he never should have been in, was created this nonprofit that never existed until weeks before he was given this deal um, and able to do what he pleased. And I am so glad that we're going to have answers. I, I interrupted you a second ago when you were making a very important point, so I want to go back to it. The deputies who were supposedly watching him didn't actually even have access to what he was doing inside his office or who was visiting him inside his office. Correct, and that is why we have found that there are, um, or there, that there is a young girl who is alleging um, that she was assaulted by this monster while he was on this work release. Um, he was at his home nine times. Um, we don't really have a really good picture of any of the things um, that were going on, and I'm just really glad that we're going to finally be able to get to the bottom of some of the things that happened here, why it happened, um, and hold people accountable. I think more than anything, you know, my job has always been as a survivor to make sure that if there is systemic failure, we fix that failure. Um, but if it's individual or an individual set of failures by individuals, we hold those people accountable. At the end of the day, he never should have been given work release. He never should have been, gotten the deal that he got. I mean, it was a 14-year-old young girl. It was a prostitution charge. She cannot even consent to sex. How is that possible? Why is that possible? How did it happen? And we're about to get to the bottom of it. Well, you also made a point earlier, which, which goes to the state. Why was he supposedly being sent to a county jail? My understanding has always been, if you're sentenced to a year or more, you go to state prison. You don't go to county jail, correct? That's correct. And those are her things that we need to find the answers to. Any more than uh, 12 months, <laughs> um, you should be going to prison. So Rick Bradshaw initially wanted to have an internal review. He almost distanced himself, like Jeffrey Epstein was here. I, I had no idea. And then, and then you started pushing, mm -hmm. and you got some pushback yourself. Uh, pushback is an understatement. Um, we had some really uh, some scary, um, some scary pushback, we'll call it, um, of people really getting very angry that we started to ask for questions. We sent a letter to the governor mm -hmm. over two weeks ago um, requesting that an internal investigation, an external independent review of the things that happened um, within this case as it related to work release. Um, and instantly we started getting phone calls, emails, crazy like things from all over the place um, telling me to back off little girl. You don't know what you're getting yourself into. Um, Do you think the source of that may have been coming from Epstein and Epstein's folks? I think that when people have a lot to fear and people have a lot to hide, um, you never, they will go and 
and have their backs against the wall, they will go full on attack mode. And I think that's what happened here. And I think a lot of people have a lot of things to hide and it's been hidden for a long time. So who knows what we'll be able to unpack with all of this. Could have been people within the jail system who, who are now vulnerable to understanding exactly what happened there. Absolutely. And at the end of the day, this system revictimized these young girls time and time and time again. And I am so glad because of local reporting, investigative work, the work of Julie Brown and others who have paid attention to this issue. While it's taken a long time, these young girls, these young survivors are going to get um, some justice. They're going to get their time to be able to, to be validated. And I think that's important and that we hold a system that Victimize these young girls again accountable. If it's found that Rick Bradshaw knew what was taking place, approved what was taking place, it's hard to imagine that the sheriff, as hands on as he is up there, didn't know. If it's shown that he knew what was going on, that it violated the basic standards, do you believe the governor, uh, who has shown himself willing to remove sheriffs if they endanger the public safety, should the governor remove Rick Bradshaw from office? Well, I would certainly never think to tell the governor what to do, but certainly this is a governor who talks a lot about. Out holding people accountable and he has done so time and time again he's ordered this independent investigation by FDLE and so if FDLE comes back and shows that these things did occur and he knowingly um, allowed things to happen that should not have I would think that it would be appropriate for the safety and welfare of our community to not have somebody like that in a position of power all right. I want to turn to another issue. Obviously, we've seen the mass shootings in Texas and Ohio. It immediately conjures up what we went through here with Parkland. And yet I've got this strange sense of deja vu listening to President Trump over the last few days and going back to 2018 when he talked about we're going to get really good background checks and went through a litany of things. And now he's saying all that again. How confident are you that we're going to see any real change come out of these latest shootings? You know, I... Um you know, I think I, when you kind of look at the things that happened after, you know, El Paso, things happened in Ohio, um, the loss of life and tragedy and horror after this last weekend, uh, after last weekend, um, you know, you think about how can we make it better? And I think um, I never think too much that the president is going to solve any of those problems. But what I am heartened by is my own president, President Galvano, talking about and charging our legislature with looking at this issue. Um, president Lee, um, who is the chair of the Infrastructure, Security and Technology um, Committee, um, has been tasked with looking at all things mass violence. Violence, targeted mass violence, gun control, and issues of the like. And I think we may have an opportunity here where we can come together. Um, we have leadership in both chambers that literally stood in the blood of the students and teachers at, at MSD. Um, you know, we have been and spent quite a bit of time since that time to today um, looking at threat assessment, um, assault weapons bans, all of the different background check pieces, uh, red flag laws, things that we can actually do. And I think now we're at a place and in a time where nothing is off the table. What do you think, what do you, what would you like to see the legislature do this coming session? You know, I would like to see an honest look at what this is. Let's have all of it out on the table. Let's debate it. Um, let's at least have the conversation. You know, my wonderful colleague, uh, Senator Stewart has had since the Pulse tragedy um, in her community an assault weapons ban. Let's have that debate. Let's have the debate around where, do you, where do you come down on assault weapons ban? I think they're terribly bad weapons of war and we should not have them and no one should have access to them in our communities. We see, I have seen the true um, destruction that they can cause. Um, I've seen the halls and, and, and the rooms of a school that look like a war zone. Um, they don't belong out on our streets. There's a perception that because of the infighting within the NRA, there's been a huge split. They've had financial difficulty that the NRA is not what it used to be. How powerful does the NRA remain in Florida? I think we should not kid ourselves. The NRA is extremely powerful um, and we need to take it seriously. And I think that's why we need to band together to have really serious conversations about what what this is, what this means, what this looks like. Let's talk about targeted mass violence. Let's talk about threat assessments. Let's put it all on the table. Whatever we come out with, I mean, after MSD, we had the most gun reform in 20 years. Let's not stop there. This is something that we, this is an issue of our time. We have to keep looking at it. There are things that are being reinvented every single day. Um, you know, there was the shooting that happened um, at the yoga studio in Tallahassee. Um, you know, we had in my committee, uh, we talked
talked about incels, that the shooter there, we know, um, hated women, and that is a group of people on the internet. And, you know, we heard the governor in the last 48 hours talk a lot about the, the dark recesses of the internet and how that springs forward some of this hatred and um, targeted violence. I'm glad that we're having this conversation. We need to move it forward. Another issue likely to come up, because we've seen it in other states across the country, and it seems to be trending this way, is the issue of trying to put the most restrictive laws on the books when it comes to abortion. You have a novel <laughs> approach as to how you want to sort of deal with this. Tell me about it. We continue to chip away at a woman's right to choose. And, um, you know, it's funny, I, after the things that happened in Alabama, I started looking at their legislature and how it was a little bit different and looked a little bit different than ours. And um, when that terribly arcane and what I, you know, label as a, the most cruel and unusual punishment, certainly to women who are survivors of sexual assault, um, forcing them to carry a baby to term if that's not what they choose to do, how many women were in that body? There were two. Two women making that decision um, in that chamber, and I look at our own legislature and, and our Senate chamber, at least. And you know, we have some strong representation, but we have nowhere near. 50, Out of the 40 50. senators, how many are female? I believe we have seven or eight, and so not nearly the numbers we should have. And so, if we're going to make some of these decisions, we should certainly have equal representation at the table. And so, um, I have a measure that would hopefully go before the voters to say that we should not be talking about any of these uh, female reproductive issues unless we have 50-50 representation at the table. So well, unless there's 20 female senators, you cannot vote on, a, on an abortion measure. Is that a stunt to just get the conversation going, or is it a, do you actually believe that's, a, that's a, a constitutionally acceptable way to sort of approach an issue? No votes about women without women. There are, is not one, not one measure on the books that should tell you how you should get a medical procedure, what type of medical procedure, but there are several that are going to tell me, my daughter, and my constituents, and the people of Florida, what they can and cannot do with their bodies. That, to me, blows my mind, and I don't think it's a stunt. I think that it may be a little far afield today for where we are, but the truth of the matter is we are a gateway right now, and we are under attack. Female reproductive rights and health care is under attack. Let nobody be mistaken about Do you about believe it. that will there be like a heartbeat bill? Will there be some of these bills introduced with a more serious intent this coming session? I think that to think that there won't be would be uh, tomfoolery. If, you know, it, it, I mean, we have already had members of the legislature talk about how God is calling them to bring the Alabama bill to Florida. And what was your reaction when uh, uh, Speaker Jose Oliva sat here and and discussed the issue of abortion with me and referred to the women as the host bodies. Look, I think that when people get heated about an issue, you know, our emotions can, as, as mine just did, um, because this is so core and fundamental to who and what we are as women, to be able to make that choice. And again, I think that if we're going to be making decisions, we have to have equal representation. As my favorite woman in all of the world says, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, until there are nine and until there is 50-50, we should make no decisions. Lauren Book, I appreciate your coming in. Thank we'll you. have you back on before the session gets started, I'm sure, no doubt. Thank, Thank you very much. All right, up next, following the shooting in El Paso and immigration raids in Mississippi, we will look at the impact those events have on creating fear among Hispanics right here in South Florida. That's when we come back.